This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Next on Big Story. COVID-19 affecting the world's most vulnerable continent. From a national psyche point of view, there's a bit of panic. Oh, this thing is going to come and kill us all. Africa's medical infrastructure pushed to the limit. If first world countries are having a harder time, then what is going to happen to us? And so if a huge part of me felt extremely helpless. Extreme measures needed to stop the spread. Threatening access to most basic needs. How can you stay at home and yet you don't have a food? I'm scared uh, COVID-19. Families fearing the worst. Unfortunately, my husband is diabetic. And being in the group of people who are vulnerable to getting COVID, I'm always worried. Complicating an already difficult situation. There's a lot of, lot of HIV, a lot of TB. We count zero with the majority of those diseases. Doctors determined to contain the spread. We're in this situation now. Let's just deal with it and try and focus on getting out of this alive. Curfew, 24 hours in Africa. Next on Big Story. I arrived here at 9 a.m. in the morning, and uh, the place was already packed with the clients who were waiting for me and our team to collect samples to be taken to the lab. This is the Kenya Medical Research Institute, KEMRI as it's known. It's one of Kenya's main testing labs for infectious diseases. Every day, hundreds of people come here to get tested. One of the nurses here is Nellie. She's been here since 2004, but she's never seen anything like this. And uh, the day has been really busy. We have not taken a break. And uh, right now we have already uh, collected a lot of samples. We have learned from the experience of, of the Western world, like the Italy and uh, America, Europe. And we have learned what they've gone through, through social media, through the news. So. I must say we are lucky that COVID came to us after it has uh, come to the other Western countries. Kenya, the hub of East Africa. Its capital, Nairobi, is home to nearly 5 million people. The first case of COVID-19 reached here in March. Kenya's reaction was swift. It banned international flights and domestic travel. They added a curfew from 7 p.m. till 5 a.m. How are you? Do you know why men die of corona and women don't? Yes. Look at her and look at yourself. You're dead, you're finished. Game over. <laughs> 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 
The man leading the team at the Kemery Labs is Professor Matilu Mwao. Professor Mwao studied molecular medicine at Oxford University. He was worried right away when he learned COVID-19 was spreading around the world. We knew there was big trouble in the world, and then in February we could smell the trouble coming around the corner. In March, in fact, we had our first case around the 13th of March. This is an interesting case because we eventually discovered that, you know, the person at the beginning didn't know they were unwell, they had coronavirus, and then they went around the country maybe seeing their friends, and uh, probably transmitted to many people. But from a national psyche point of view, there was a bit of panic. Oh, this thing is going to come and kill us all. And then some prominent people in the world, people who are influential, said, in fact, these Africans are finished. No one knows why much of sub-Saharan Africa has fewer COVID cases than the rest of the world, and a lower mortality rate. In Kenya, less than 2% of corona cases leads to death, a remarkably low percentage. Maybe we didn't die as much as we thought we would, and we didn't overwhelm the hospitals the way we thought we would. There are no bodies right now lying in the streets. That doesn't mean we are not infected. There are very many infected people, and several people have died. And now we're asking ourselves as scientists, what happened between March and now that stood to us during this period? It's one the demographics, our populations are young in Africa. In Kenya, the median age is probably 18 or 17 years. So younger is better for coronavirus. Number two, we also knew our, the fact that our non-communicable disease problem is uh, not as big, is important. We have diabetes, we have hypertension, we have other things, but not as much as uh, in other places, right? And then there's another thing that needs to be thought about. Infectious diseases are very common around here. So, uh, for coronavirus, we think that us guys have been interacting with these sorts of viruses for thousands of years. So we've adapted somewhat, and that probably has stood to us at this time. We realized maybe we can handle this thing. And luckily for us, corona was not Ebola. If it was Ebola, I don't know what would have happened, to be honest. Meanwhile, one of Nelly's patients, Charles, has returned for his results. I requested you come and fix your sample uh, like in person. Because yeah. Babu is positive. So, you have any symptoms of that? Symptoms are easy. I can't remember. Coho, I can't remember. Na come and sore throat. Yeah. You come and sit down. Meza to pay in kila pen. Pen kila pen kila. We need to advise unless. Uh, Symptoms are because you una feel you come going to San and do in the hospital. You can not familiar. Any kind of one to go to Zango Tava? Any Sakesho, one Number one. Number two, when you come here, you self isolate. For number, I love how Wendy Casini. Sindio, yes. Did you post your job in Gani? I said it to office. Don't get anxious. New at Wengi, by the way. Yeah. Across the continent, South Africa is beginning to feel the impact of COVID-19. This is General Justice Kizenga Mpansa Regional Hospital in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. 43 miles from Durban, it services a community of 700,000 people. This was the first South African hospital to be quarantined following the COVID-19 outbreak. It was also the first to lose a healthcare worker. The outbreak was exacerbated by a collective fear of speaking out. In South Africa, we deal with crime, and it doesn't affect you until it affects someone that's really close to you. And it's the same with COVID. Dr. Akron Misra grew up knowing that medicine was his calling. He began working in the surgical department of this hospital two years ago. 
after completing his studies in China. I've always wanted to be a doctor since the age of five. It's always been a dream of mine, therefore it's something I did pursue. But it was the actual staying in China that was the real gift, experiencing life outside of your own country, outside of your own home, which a lot of people don't get an opportunity to do. So I was very lucky in that way, and it showed me a different culture, and it showed me a different mentality and a different way of life. It's got a special place in my heart. Dr. Misra knew South Africa would need to prepare for COVID differently than the rest of the world. I think compared to the rest of the world, our preparations had to be tailor-made for South Africa. We very different in terms of diseases that we face in South Africa. There's a lot of, lot of HIV, a lot of TB. I mean, we ground zero with the majority of those diseases. Complicating South Africa's efforts, the country's history of prevalent viruses. 7.7 million South Africans are HIV positive, and at least 60% are co-infected with TB. A severely immunocompromised country, South Africans are still grappling with the stigma attached to TB and HIV. COVID-positive patients, fearing being shunned by their community, are choosing to remain silent. This silence would make it challenging to spot new cases of COVID-19 early on. People are scared, and people may even come in and deny having a fever, deny having a cough. And it's happened, and it happens a lot of the time. As with HIV, when we didn't know much about the disease and the communities weren't well educated on it, there was quite a big stigma against the disease that anyone with HIV was almost a death sentence as such. And I think something similar is happening with COVID at the moment, that any single person with a cough is now being isolated and put away, whereas the cough could be for any other reason. Dr. Gustavo Lopez, originally from Cuba, has been at Stanger for over a decade. As acting CEO, it fell to him to prepare his team early. My parents were not doctors, but I think as I grew up, uh, I saw that I like actually working with people and then that evolved into through medicine. And I remember when early February, I started to put together the team and did a presentation for them. I could see that perhaps I could have been seen as going too far ahead. There was a still no infection in South Africa. And that could be because people are at a certain degree of denial, of course, that this is bad, but it's far, it's in China. How will it get here? South Africa is seeing an alarming rate of casualties, with infections and deaths climbing into the thousands. I remember sitting there and just thinking to myself, what are really the chances that that would hit South Africa. Medical intern Dr. Jolandi Rootman was preparing for a June wedding. I think no one in the last five years was thinking to themselves, oh, I'm planning a wedding, but it might be cancelled due to a global pandemic. Both of us are brought up with traditional values, so we would only move in together after we get married. So, I was supposed to get married this year, 13th of June. That didn't happen. I woke up with a very heavy heart. Instead of doing nothing, we said, no, we'll just have like an um, exercise wedding where we just prepare for the real thing. Just commemorated the day in a small way. And that's also something to remember for the rest of our lives. On Thursday, March 5th, South Africa reported its first positive case. The first confirmed positive COVID case in South Africa was a 38-year-old male uh, returning on a trip from Italy. That same month, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced a 21-day total lockdown. It was one of the toughest in the world. It included a curfew with movement restricted to essential services only. All outdoor exercise was banned 
as was the sale of alcohol and tobacco. During the lockdown period, initially during stage five, it actually it was like a ghost town. It was like you were driving in one of these post-apocalyptic movies where I went out in the morning and you'd see not a single car. That was very, very different. Driving to work that Friday, it was just, there was such a quietness on the road. I could drive a little faster than 120. Not that I think my car can go past 120, but I tried to push it. Dr. Rootman's housemate and colleague, Dr. Elise Temming, is also a medical intern at Stanger Hospital. I am a very uh, empathetic person. I enjoy working with people, and it's nice to see if you can actually make a difference in a patient. Dr. Temming welcomed the lockdown. I feared that we would follow the same route as what you saw happening in Italy. I was scared. I felt that this was necessary. I was rooting for it. When I heard that the decision was made to go into lockdown, I was relieved. Because they are both major entry points into Africa, Kenya and South Africa were among the first on the continent to report COVID-19 cases. The two countries have something else in common, high population densities in cities. The crowded streets are proving detrimental. Two and a half million people live in Nairobi's slums. The informal settlements lack running water and sewage systems. Even before COVID-19 came, deadly viral infections were highly present. Now with COVID-19 on the rise and curfew beginning at 9 p.m., there's a need for ambulances in the night. Doctors Without Borders is helping at the slum of Matare. Matare slum, which is one of the biggest, highly populated slum in Kenya. And uh, most people are low social economic status. They live on uh, mostly handouts day to day. Mercy tells us that she receives over three times more calls at night since COVID. She says first responders fear that most cases are virus related. During this time of curfew, most people cannot access the essential health needs. There's, there's, no, there's no even somebody to take them to the hospital. Like some of them used to use their motorbikes. Even the taxi people, if you call them, they cannot come right now. So that's why it prompts them now to get another way. How can they come to the clinic? How can they get help? So that's why they call for an ambulance most of the time. MSF call center, how can I help you? Mom, she done in Indian, this idea, and you're busy, dark on the two jet knocks idea. Mhm. Tangulini, ma'am. Unaskia Joto. When COVID came in March, there was a lot of fear, anxiety. There wasn't much information about it, how it spread. So there was a lot of stress and panic, really. I got a little scared. It, it never really hit me that it could get here. I always thought it would be contained somewhere else before it got to Kenya. And then the first case happens in Kenya, and uh, first you panic a, a little bit. So there was that little bit of stress, but uh, with information, and with the provision of the protective equipment, the stress kind of goes away. I understand that uh, it's the front line. So I've come to terms with the whole scenario. Uh, 
every patient now with respiratory symptoms has to be treated like a suspected COVID case. So sometimes uh, you find patients who are handled as COVID-19, but probably they have another condition. And uh, sometimes you never know, it could be an asthmatic patient with uh, difficulty in breathing and uh, could, the patient could also be having COVID-19. So it's hard to separate the two respiratory symptoms right now are uh, most likely to be uh, COVID-19. Another one? Huh? Miriam? 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 To say Diana to Pande Apo Kokitanda? Pole Pole? Panda Kanyanga Ju, Kanyanga Stairs? Ah, could you need chini? Maskia cake, what? Miss out to dump a tear to Noma Pandagani Bunyanesh. Now up to Doctors suspect Miriam has COVID nineteen. They'll rush her to hospital, where she'll be properly diagnosed. Under lockdown, the locals of Durban are beginning to worry about the future. Local upholsterer Tulani Tsungu believes the lockdown was a good thing, but worries about the long-term repercussions. I've been watching the news overseas just from January. I've been telling people this thing is coming here. They didn't believe me. So what they did is just fine. I think maybe they could just let us work and only God knows what's going to happen because you can't sit around not working. With unemployment rates skyrocketing since lockdown, Filani Shezi, who owns a local events company, realize that young people need to do something to help break the cycle of poverty. Today, we are out here. We are handing over the food parcels. We see that there is a need for us to stand up for people who cannot stand up for themselves. We have donated food to families headed by youngsters, to elderly people who have a lot of little grandchildren with no parents, people who are unemployed, the list is endless. Basically, they are all vulnerable in one way or the other. Lockdown affected a lot in people's ability to go out and, and source foods for them to eat. You cannot even go and sell fruits. You're selling it to who? You cannot go and look for jobs. People will say, no, everyone must be indoors. Many South Africans live on the breadline. It's difficult to enforce mask wearing, sanitizing, and social distancing, when for most, the need for food outweighs the fear of infection. People are afraid of starving other than the virus, because once I'm weak, then I'm vulnerable. So if I'm hungry, that means the diseases are easy to affect me. The fridge is always empty, empty. And now we ran out of food. We don't know how to eat, even today. You can't live without food. It's hard to live without food, I know. So poverty is the real reason people are like are not scared of going ahead with the, their own life, knowing that they can get sick and, and die. But what can I do? They don't have a choice. They have to earn a living.
We've also seen many patients coming to hospital basically asking for admission because they cannot self-isolate at home and often there are five or six people living in a very small house. So social distancing isn't really always possible, especially inside a house. The lockdown has affected people's ability to eat um, by them not having enough income to buy food, them not having the ability to go to work. We're not even allowed to go outside. So those who would make gains by crops or gardening, they couldn't go to do such activities for them to have enough food to eat. Comfort after my life because I can't do anything. It's like I have to ask for help because at work nothing is happening. Everything is shut. There's a lot of people that are now going to, to go sink into poverty and things like that, and that's going to result in its own circumstances, its own hardships in those lives. The curfew put in place in Kenya has affected a number of workers on the night shift. Truck drivers transporting fresh produce now need various permits to be able to travel. I'm Sodiambo. I'm a driver going to Nairobi. So I deliver yogurt, water and milk. And nowadays, I'm going less trips because uh, before COVID-19 we are going like uh, three days in a week but nowadays I'm going one trip or two trips so it affects me because I can't get uh, money that I, like the way I had before nowadays no job people uh, crying no money I have a family. How, first I have to look how my family will be. I'm the father, I'm the one who look for them food. And uh, the government says stay at home. How can you stay at home and yet you don't have a food? I'm scared uh, COVID-19. To enforce the curfew, the Kenyan police have set up roadblocks around the entire country. Anyone trying to get through needs to show they have the correct paperwork. The drivers get their temperature taken by a nurse. If they have a fever, they'll be taken into quarantine. Because of the curfew, Otiembo is unable to go home once he delivers his goods. He sleeps in his truck and continues his work the following day. It has now been two weeks since he last saw his wife and kids. The curfew has changed a lot about the way Kenyans live day to day. What once was simple has now become much harder. Delivering a baby at night has now become a matter of life or death. We have had a rise in mothers in pregnancy or uh, mothers in labor. They are calling the ambulance a lot more. Maybe previously they would just walk to the nearest clinic, but right now uh, with the curfew they are unable to go outside. I'll tell you about one specific one. A mother called in labor. We responded very fast, uh, only to find she had already pushed in the house. And there were, it was a stillbirth, twins. Still, she had lost two babies in the house. It was very stressful. Uh, you try everything you can to see if you can revive the babies. 
in these cases you just wish maybe the call had come in 30 minutes earlier probably if covid was not here she would have gone to a health center during the day they would have done a scan maybe identified the problem maybe she would have been already hospitalized in a facility and she would have uh, the twins would have survived Realizing the magnitude of the cases, Kenyan authorities have turned a building at Nairobi's Kenyatta National Hospital into a COVID-19 ward. Margaret Ogonga is a senior nurse specializing in infectious diseases. She's made a career of dealing with pandemics across the African continent. I'm a frontline worker in Kenya during this COVID time, and I responded to the West African Ebola outbreak in the year 2015. I went to Liberia under African Union, and it was Africans for Africans, meaning Africans this time had to come out for their own Africans. Came back and opened the first infectious diseases unit in Kenya. And since then, I've been managing and uh, treating the COVID patients. We have an admission of 24th June. It's a very sick patient who needs assistance. Eh? So it's one of the patients for total nursing care, a patient with COVID and ascites, and it's on oxygen therapy, fine and repeat the mask, eh? so you continue with the oxygen administration. So it's a very sick patient who needs close monitoring. I think uh, we continue keeping safe. It's luckily, most of us are not infected. Currently, we are seeing the numbers of staffs getting infected in other counties. So let's continue trying not to get infected. The challenges we are facing with the coveralls were able to use this other kind of PPEs that is uh, needed by WHO. And I think uh, let's keep up and keep safe. Can you close with a word of prayer? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful day. What I learned during Ebola outbreak is my safety first and also to be loyal to my patients. And I think somebody just needs to be courageous Empathetic, maybe sometimes when you get a patient who has COVID, take this patient as a friend, a brother or a sister. So these people just need to be encouraged, talked to, and to empower others. Amen. Only the most severe cases of COVID-19 are now brought into hospitals in Kenya in order to keep limited beds available for those in need. This hospital only has 75 beds. When the first case of COVID was uh, diagnosed in China, we started preparing in Kenya. But for the past now two months, it's been hectic. The patients are very sick compared to our first patients. They are, most of them are on oxygen. Uh, though I'd count, our mortality rate is still on the lower side. But this time around, we are seeing very, very sick patients. Most of the time when we see somebody very sick, the person maybe could be having another illness, which is maybe a disease that has made the person to be immunocompromised. Losing a patient first things first is not easy because at the beginning we realized a patient was coming very stable and the patient sleeps and dies. 
So when you when you start seeing a patient deteriorating, you get traumatized because maybe for the past 14 days this person has not been able to see his or her family. So this patient is dying and is dying not surrounded by his or her close relatives. So his or her close relatives are us. When we lose patients, we even cry. So I would say it's very traumatizing to lose, especially the youngsters. It's traumatizing to see somebody struggling on oxygen. It's traumatizing to see somebody who has been managing it well, dying due to COVID. It is so sad. Despite lockdowns and safety precautions, South Africa's measures to keep people safe have inevitably broken down. Locals and the professionals treating them are catching COVID-19. On April 29th, a medical consultant from the pediatric department tested positive at the local hospital. I was anxious and scared at the same time. We've heard on the news that uh, this disease is a killer disease. Suddenly, there was just this surge and people, actually staff members, were testing positive. I think that day we swapped 250 uh, patients and staff members. And then the next day we had to swap again. It took three days to swap all the patients and all the staff members. Doctors believe the outbreak was caused by a mother housed at a nearby Borders Lodge after giving birth. She reportedly failed to disclose that her husband had tested positive after an outbreak at a local supermarket. Her silence sparked the chain of events that led to the closure of this local hospital. Second year medical intern, Dr. Menzi McKeezy, was called in for screening after the new mom tested positive. The very first inpatient that was diagnosed as being COVID positive was a patient that I just finished taking bloods from and examining. I was with my colleagues. Uh, I was called to the outside and they told me that she had tested COVID positive. The numbers started going up. Now we are actually faced with a real pandemic. I was also following the trajectory of the illnesses in America. Um, and I saw that if first world countries are having a harder time, then what is going to happen to us? And so if a huge part of me felt extremely helpless. And also because I live in a flat that has people that are non-medical personnel. So I thought, oh my God, what if I get it? And then my first cough or my first symptom is when I'm walking past someone, a child in that building, what is going to happen to me? While the media sought to place blame, doctors at the hospital sought solutions. It's very difficult to pinpoint a finger that this is patient zero. All I know is it was brought into the hospital and it spread like wildfire and that's the fear. It's very easy for me as a doctor to say, oh no, this person went, came into contact with someone COVID, they should know better that the transmission. But a lot of our population aren't that well educated and people need to not be afraid because that's what will stop it. The fear and not knowing basically the ignorance will result in things like this happening. I just kind of felt that's not something I, I want to focus on. I want to focus on dealing with the problem. We're in this situation now. Let's just deal with it and try and focus on getting out of this alive and not to blame people. The fact of the matter is that it could literally happen to anyone. Despite the rigorous prevention measures in place, the hospital was forced to quarantine after 19 people tested positive for COVID-19. Among them, nine mothers, two babies, four doctors, and a nurse. That is never easy for healthcare workers and for, for leaders in the health system. We had to make harsh decisions to close down certain services, to quarantine the hospital, and to put the wheels in motion to recover as soon as we could, because we knew that the services of this hospital are essential to an entire district, a population of around 700,000 people. The hospital was declared quarantined and the hospital would be decontaminated. 
I remember thinking just, it's happening, it's happening. You've anticipated it for such a long time, and then you just think that day is here. I felt nervous. You kind of just go through your head. I'll be very surprised if I don't test positive. I was in emergency department and it was very, very bad. We were so scared. We didn't know what to do. Anxiety and everything. Initially, he has put us through situations that none of us was probably before. It takes a toll on all of us. We are dealing with so many emotions on a daily basis and it's exhausting. A couple of days later, we got the news that we're not accepting any new patients. All patients will be referred to other hospitals in Durban. We all still had to go to work. We see the patients that were already at the hospital. Any patients that required surgery or any urgent management were all transferred out once we knew that their results were negative. COVID patients were transferred to the newly refurbished isolation and quarantine wards in Durban. Specialized ambulance wash bays ensured that emergency vehicles were decontaminated after dropping off the ill. During the quarantine period in the hospital, first of all, we had to make sure that the number of staff was reduced to prevent no infecting others. So what happened was that staff was made to make shifts so that we could ensure social distancing, which was basically vital in this regard. We started screening all staff that came on duty, and staff that were having any flu-like symptoms were told not to report on duty. Aware of the risks they themselves face, medical teams in Kenya doubled down with their personal protective equipment. But there is some concern the kit is not protecting the workers enough. We are coming down from Ebola. So now we are introducing a gown that would be more comfortable, we hope. And we would like to get reports from you on how you're going with it. So for taking care of COVID patients, we'll use the head cover the face shield, which is a mask, and then the enhanced gown and the boots because of it spread through droplet and contacts. Margaret is all dressed up. How does she look? Does she look uh, protected enough? Most of the patients we are receiving now, in terms of nursing care, they require that kind of close contact. You have to bend, get close to this patient. So meaning, and some of them cough, but now, if you leave some parts uh, exposed, then I think it may be a, a big concern. Yeah. So you need to look uh, into that also. Yeah. Mm. Mm. If uh, there are no more questions or concerns, we would like to tell you we appreciate what you're doing. And uh, as, we, as we continue to learn about COVID-19, let's keep each other in check. And we also go back and read our books and we trust that you're going to keep safe and thank you for making time for us. Every day when I get home, I'm scared like, what if today I'm exposed? Since March, my, I think my lifestyle has changed. I have I've been a little bit distant with my family. Unfortunately, my husband is diabetic and being in the group of people who are vulnerable to getting COVID, I'm always worried. At the beginning, I used to like to test every week, every two weeks. Most of the time I'm at work and the few minutes or the few days I'm at home, we are not in close contact. I do not eat in the same dining table with my kids. I use disposable plates, cups and spoons. We do not share just in case I am infected. I keep doing my tests, I'm not infected. So maybe I'm just thinking, Protecting my face, nose, and mouth has contributed to, to me not being infected and me not infecting my family. Okay, thank you. Back at Kemri, Nellie has finished her shift. Before she leaves to go home, she calls Charles, a patient who was confirmed COVID positive, to see how he's getting on. Hello. Yes. Charles, sabari yako. Salama. Unanikumbuka mimi ni Nelly wa Kemri. Eh. 
Unaendeleaje we mwenyewe hali yako unasikiaje uko aje? Aiko iko sawa. Oh. Eh. Kuna dalili za zote zenye unaweza kuwa unajisikia unajihisi kama maybe joto mwilini kama kukohoa ama uko sawa kabisa? Eh dilienda hospitali. Eh nitapewa madawa. Kimawazo unaweza kuwa una una wasiwasi ama unaweza kuwa unajihisi kwamba unaogopa kidogo uh, It's not the end of the world that's good Yeah So you so you are very positive and you are you are facing it <laughs> Oh sawa sawa Yeah. Eh, ni hayo ndio nilikuwa nataka kujua kidogo. Yeah. Nikitaka kukupigia tena tafadhali niruhusu. Ah, sawa. Asante sana Charles. Thank you so yeah. much. Ah, thank you too. As the Kenyans work to stay protected, the situation only worsens at South Africa's Stanger Hospital. More than 40 staff members have tested positive for COVID-19. So many people tested positive. You feel like there's no way out. And how are we going to do this? When is this going to end? For Dr. Lopez, the pressure to contain the spread is mounting. I have been through phases where I get angry because I know that if we fail on this, the consequences could be immense because you have no luxury if you, if you have to lead people. You have to keep that self-discipline and, and self-awareness. And perhaps it's telling, it's, it's demanding on you, but it's, it's the role that you're supposed to play. The people that have tested positive, I personally know some of them, and you know, it's not like they're negligent in hand sanitizing or making sure that they are following the correct precautionary measures. It just, it just happened. Despite their best efforts, the staff lost a friend and colleague when an orderly succumbed to COVID-19. It's here almost on a daily basis, and it is very sad, and it just shows you how close to home it's really hitting. If you lose a loved one that you can't go and attend the funeral, I think that's the part that, that a lot of South Africans are feeling. It only hit very hard when I found out that someone actually that was working in the hospital passed away because we only think it's the patients that pass away, not the actual staff working with you. It's not just medical professionals that fear for their well-being. For COVID-19 survivor Miriam, the uncertain future proves terrifying. Nilipoingia kwa ambulance, akaniambia akantia bado nguvu usiwe na wasiwasi utasaidiwa kuwa tu mjasiri. Nilishtuka kidogo, niligonjeka tu mara moja hadi nikatapika kwa hiyo gari. Nilipofika huko KU nimefika kama niko tu mgonjwa ili nisumbua akili. Kujeni mnawe? Okay nilipanic. Juu hata niko na watoto last born wangu ako na 6 years. Ili nishtua roho ati kama naweza kuufa watoto wangu watakuaje watabaki aje nani ataniangalia juu nikiangalia vizuri sina mtu mwenye amejiweza mwenye anaweza handle watoto wangu so kunisumbua na ili nisumbua roho si mnajua corona iko na waua nime recover but sija recover kabisa kabisa hata kulingana venye tulikuwa tunareleaseiwa tunaambiwa una quarantine kwa nyumba unaweza fuatiliwa na simu ukienda mbali kwa sababu maisha yetu haiendi vizuri juu ya maneno ya hivi covid Back in May a survey was carried out in the slums of Nairobi to judge how life had changed due to covid 68% said they had skipped a meal because they didn't have enough money to buy food 
As the number of COVID cases rise, one wonders what will happen to people in these slums. Though the current outlook looks bleak, across the continent, medical workers and residents alike refuse to give in. Any frontliner, maybe in Kenya, in Africa, all over the world, this thing is here with us. We need to work, we need to take care of it and fight it. COVID is here to stay for some time. If a vaccine is found, that is when maybe things will change. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's so much doom and gloom, but sometimes you also have to look at a small sparkle in all of this darkness. The whole world is actually facing the same thing. It also brings some form of unity worldwide, so everyone is having to deal with this problem. On one hand, the panic is justified. For people with comorbidities, it's a, a bit harsh on them. So the panic is uh, to protect those who are most vulnerable. While people are really dying of COVID, other people are dying because of other things which would have been prevented if it was not for COVID. It's a very tricky situation. I think the COVID pandemic has completely revolutionized the world. It's a war against an unknown enemy. It's forced humanity to stick together and Therefore, every single human being is responsible, uh, not just healthcare workers and people that are on, actually on the front line. Every single human being has their responsibility to stay home, and therefore everyone is on the front line with us. You feel, okay, we can do this, we're gonna get through this, and you feel positive and thinking there's gonna be a vaccination. You read about all these people working, it's like the whole world is working towards a common goal and it's just to beat this thing. It brought us together, it made us be one person or united. So our future is still bright despite of the, the COVID-19. If you want to know about Africa and so on, it would be nice to consider that Africa has its own experts and us guys do this thing every day. We may not know everything, but in terms of what is there on the ground, we know a lot. We know viruses, we've experienced viruses, we've been living with them for forever, and they've never finished us off, 